Hey, Brian here, and I'm here with a video where we're going to talk about some recent developments in Viking Age shields and discoveries. We're also going to be doing a reply. I'll be doing a reply to Arn Koitz, who did a very nice video and his beliefs about the Gawkstead ship shields. He's into uh, archaeology. He's an archaeologist. And also, we will be doing our own experiments today with cheese glue or casein glue and seeing what type of alkaline material makes a difference, whether it be stronger, uh, more translucent, uh, how quick it takes to dry. We're going to try all that, see what happens. Is it going to take longer to dry? Is it going to be stronger? We're going to be able to see the images that I put through these little discs. I put little images on the disc, and you can see the images right here. But the first thing I'd like to do, I would like to thank VKNG Jewelry. This ring that I'm wearing here is a beautiful ring, the Odin ring. Uh, it's from the Elite Silver Series from VKNG Jewelry. Sponsored this video. Uh, they sponsored our Thor's Hammer video, and you can see my beautiful Bronze Age Thor's Hammer. We did the whole history of Donar, Thor, Thor, uh, whatever name you want to call him by, and we went all the way back to the Neolithic era through the Bronze Age to lead up to the Scandinavian or Viking Age gods that everybody knows so iconically. We talk about whether he had an axe or whether he had a hammer. And we also talk about Viking Age war hammers because everybody believes Vikings had war hammers. In a sense they did, they did have hammers that were made on the back of axes. So we test that in the video. So if you haven't seen that, go by there and check that out. Uh, they sponsored our shield video. And the way that works, this ring that I picked out looked very much like a, sh a shield or a door of Odin. So what I did is I created a lindenwood shield, which we had not used lindenwood before, and it showed amazing properties and characteristics. And we have an entire video, thanks to them, that they sponsored showing how to make a Viking Age shield. The only thing that's not totally period about this shield is probably the runes on the front, because we'd have no evidence they had runes on them, and it's a bit smaller. And the reason why is the materials are expensive, and lindenwood and everything we used, we were only able to make one this size, but it was perfect for testing. They sponsored the test video we did with all Viking Age style weaponry, and it performed wonderfully. You might want to go by there and check that out. It performed every bit as good as uh, uh, raw formings, if not better, because they did use rawhide. And it's made out of lindenwood, which is the famed wood from the uh, sagas and from the Anglo-Saxon rune poems. So be sure and go by and check that out, check out our hammer video. But what I'd like to do is bring up that they always give an awesome offer to all of our viewers. And since you all like Viking Age jewelry, like this ring and the necklace, and they have all kinds of bracelets, they've reactivated the codes. And that's why you see me standing here with these pieces already glued together. And you can see we have them glued together, and you can see through the hide. And we're going to talk about the glues and how they performed and evaluate them in a moment. Uh, but that'll be after the process of putting them together, of course. Uh, the reason you see the end result already is because I wasn't able to put the video out as fast as I wanted. And they were gracious enough to reactivate all the codes, so you'll find them down below with links. So it will be 30 Thrand for the hammer, uh, bracelets, and pendants. And that'll be anything in the catalog. And also, it will be, that's 30% off, 30 Thrand. It'll be 20% off if you use 20 Thrand with the link down below for all other items in the shop. But not only that, they are having a summer sale right now, and it's 25% off on top of the other discounts. So most of the items are going to be ridiculously low price. So now's the time if you want to get this kind of jewelry and support them for supporting our channel here and the videos you like to see, at least go by and give them a look through the catalog. Because if you do want something, now's the time to get it. Uh, without further ado, we will go on continuing our video and our reply to Arn Coates. Uh, and how these were constructed here and what glues we're using. First thing I would like to bring up talking about shield tests and us testing the shield here and testing the shield over here. There's been a shield that was created uh, by Rolf Warming and Society of Combat Archaeology. Uh, it was created by Tom Ursel, and uh, he made the shield after they did extensive examinations of the beer cup piece. There's a piece of shield, and I'll show the image. It's uh, a clamp, a shield clamp, uh, out of copper material, probably like a, a brass or a bronze clamp. And it's holding two facings back and front of leather and a rimming on a piece of shield. Now, this is very intriguing because it was found at Birka, meaning it wasn't a bog find. If it was a bog find, it could have tannins in it from the bog because the bog's full of tannins. As a matter of fact, I even spoke with Vitgard Vaiki on Twitter about that. And he said, yeah, if it was from a 
bog, you know, it has lots of tannins. But from there, if you find tannins in it, which he said he found spruce wood tannin, tannins in it, it was probably Viking Age tanned leather. So the rimming was cowhide. The facings uh, back and front were sheepskin, which, yeah. Uh, Alphostan, King Alphostan of, of Saxony, said that uh, no shield right shall cover a shield in sheepskin, at least he'd be fined. So he'd probably turn over in his grave. But that shield performed excellent. I linked it all over Facebook. I will have a link down below for you. Be sure and check out Rolf Warming's uh, and the uh, Society of Combat Archaeology's shield test. Uh, if I find a YouTube version, I will try to link that down below as well. There may be one. I think he has a YouTube site. And maybe it'll be more detailed. It'll be even better. And he's got a paper coming out soon on the findings and so on. But I think that the uh, Viking Age tanned leather that was probably brained, washed several times, and then smoked, performed almost as good as our rawhide here. So what I think we need to find out is, was there some advantage to using tanned leather? That was it could it be more waterproofed? I mean, was it better at sea? Or was it just because at Birka at that time, it was easier for that man to make a shield quicker because the leather was already pre-processed to make other things out of, and instead of going and finding an adequate animal and killing it or getting somebody to let him kill an animal and making rawhide, was it easier just to go to the local tanner and get leather and he knew it would work just as well? We don't know. And according to Tom, which I want to give a shout out to him, Hale, uh, I've been talking to him online, uh, it is not like modern tan leather. So don't think just going out and buying modern tan leather and covering a shield with it with a case and glue is going to do the same effect. But like I said, it performed about the same as these. Next thing I would like to cover is I had a video made to me after linking a diagram from Vithgord Vaiki. It's off of Twitter and it's about the Goxton sh shields. It shows how the holes were put through at angles, how the uh, rimming on both these shields is done the same way goes all the way around the shield and it's laced on and glued the way I did it. And it has the facings back in front of rawhide. And it's glued with casing glue. His argument is that he doesn't think, and this is uh, from uh, Arn Kowitz, he did a video, and he's an archaeologist, that he doesn't believe that the Goxted ships were covered with anything. For one reason, they have pigment on them. They're covered in pigment. And his other argument was that he doesn't totally believe my idea that they would cover them with translucent rawhide and that you could see the images through it. Because one of the images I showed, and I will show it right now, uh, was from a grave. And it's very intricate. It's, you can see how the little dots on it, it's black and white and red. And it is from the Isle of Man. And uh, it's from Yerby, Balatira, Yerby. And it's a grave. It, a man was found in a mound and in a uh, oak coffin. And uh, on top of him, we found the shield. But the thing is, the pattern that we find on it is actually on top of the leather. Whether it be rawhide or whether it be uh, leather itself, that was put on with a gesso. The gesso was made out of some kind of organic material and probably egg yolks and then painted on. So egg yolks and then it was painted on the black, red, and white. Yes, it's very fine, but he is correct because I do agree with him about a lot of things he's saying. It would have been done on the front of the shield, especially something that small and intricate. I don't think it would show through very well, even though I did do something like that on these today that we're going to be testing. And if you look at them, yeah, this is very fine detail, but that's just an experiment to see how well that shows through with our glues. But the other shield I did show was from a grave in Denmark, and it was, and it was from uh, Grimstrom. And in that grave, we find a shield laying from about uh, head to knees on the gentleman, and it was probably a shield blank. And I have a shield blank right here, because the way I used to make shields is I would get hardwood plywood, but not plywood in the sense it's quarter inch plywood. This is cabinetry plywood, and it's covered with a thin veneer. And if you were to look at the edging, you would see it's all planks pretty much. The only thin veneer is on the front and back. It could split very easily. You have to treat it like a bunch of planks glued together and support it the same way and construct it the same way to have a shield work properly and then rim it very good. The rimming has to be awesome without a, a facing and a backing on it. And uh, yeah, I can see that. If you did a shield right and the way it's held in a center grip and the, the uh, 
handle covering the full back and then proper rimming of some sort, even if it be rawhide, the shield will hold up to a degree because of the way it's held in the hand and the way it gives. But I do have some disagreements because that shield being a shield blank on the man was never finished. So we don't know if they would have tried to cover it with something. It had no center boss or if he just made a shield and somebody when they went to bury him decided to put something pretty on it. I mean to make it look nice because he never completed it. We don't know how he ended up with a shield blank on him that was painted. It wasn't a completed shield most likely. Never found anything else unless somebody decided they wanted to remove the hardware, which I don't think it had any evidence that it had hardware on it like a Umboy or center boss or anything like that, and keep it. So who knows? That's normally not a standard practice. The center boss, the weapons, and all are considered part of the warriors and go with them uh, to the afterlife or to the grave, the grave mound. But what I'd like to say is his argument on the Goxted ship shields is he says that they were painted. They found pigment on the facing of the shield. This is true. The reason I get the idea that uh, the rawhide would be fine on them if they were covered back in front of the rawhide, and the image I linked was supposed to be of the Goxted ship shields and why they believe, how they believe they were constructed originally, covered in rawhide back in front and rimmed and stitched on. Not all the shields are the same. Uh, all the shields are broken. I mean, they're broken in pieces and reconstructed. So sometimes you'll see some holes and areas on them, but not all the way around because they're not all the same shield boards. They did the best with this mighty jigsaw puzzle, uh, the conservators, but did not do it properly necessarily. Say there's boards from one shield on another shield and vice versa. But what he brings up is the thicknesses of the shield with proper rimming would hold up, but they also have paint on the uh, surface. These shields were all 80 to 90 centimeters. Huge. They're very, very thin, but uh, the pigment on them would show through because it's only yellow and black. Each shield is yellow and black, and they believe it was yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black down the side of the ship. They were solid colors. There's no intricate anything on them. Nothing like these here. So translucent rawhide would definitely show a background color. They might have had other stuff painted on top of them. That's where I got my idea that they could have been going for not necessarily too much of a 3D effect, but putting something on top of a background, but it would be much easier to have a background already a solid color. And you can use case and paints, which are very similar to case and glues. The only differences are you add a pigment to it. So if you would add a pigment to the glue, when you were to glue the actual hide on, not necessarily paint it, but just add pigment to the glue, you would have a black or yellow background that you could paint anything on once you completed the shield. But his shield that he shows in the video that they tested and had rimming around it, and it didn't really take any damage until they started cutting into the rimming itself, and then it started splitting, is very thick. The Guxted ship shields are anywhere from six millimeters to 10 millimeters thick, estimated in the very center and taper much thinner towards the edge. So my thing is, if you're going to make just a shield out of wood of that thickness, wouldn't you just keep it even? Because just the wood itself, if it was white pine, think about it, these are white pine with just some rimming. Could be uh, 10 millimeters all the way to the edge, and it wouldn't make it much more elegant if you're not gonna cover it. The only reason I can see why you'd want to thin the shield out is because you were putting heavy hides on it. If you're putting heavy hides on it, you need to make the wood as light as possible, and then how thin the wood gets towards the edge doesn't matter. I can take this shield here, and I've done it, put it between two soul horses, and stand on it, just like it speaks of in the sagas. They talk about spears, and putting them under the shields, and hoisting it up, the man on top of it, and then him using an ax to grip the top of a wall and pull himself up. So what this means, is that, uh, that he'd be way up there on the wall, the shield has to be able to support the weight of a man in armor. Also, they talk about carrying people on their shields. To carry somebody on the shield, it would have to be able to support their weight. And I'm sorry, but if it was just uh, five to six millimeters thick in the middle, and it tapers even thinner toward the, toward the edge, even with the handle stretching the entire length on the back the, uh, across the grain, it would still be very difficult to carry somebody on it without the shield breaking, the full body weight of someone to use it as kind of a stretcher to carry a dead man off the field or an injured man. And they do bring that up in some of the sagas. So I think the shields are stronger than what most people think. I do think that the newest test proves that even with the sheep skin that was tanned. And that a solid color would definitely show through and I don't see the point in tapering it all the way to the edge if you have such a large shield. 
if you're not going to cover it. There'd be no real point in doing that. And I do believe they probably made some shields for, like, let's say, home ganga. They talk about other shield constructions. They talk about iron bands going across the back of the shield. Uh, in one of the, uh, I believe, Icelandic uh, laws talking about dueling shields having bands on the back of them. Well, that kind of makes sense. If they were home ganga shields and you're going to tear them up and stand on a 10 by 10 foot square, because there was a ritualistic duel, and beat the heck out of the shields and take turns throwing blows, meaning each person takes a turn, uh, they flip a coin to see who goes first, then you would need uh, a shield that you didn't really care about. You're not going to tear up a shield that really matters to you. Arm codes, I would like to say that we do agree on one point. Not all shields were made the same way. Like you brought up yourself, there was a bark shield found, but it was not from the Viking Age. It was earlier period. And it was much more sturdy than they expected when they did the uh, living history reconstruction of it. You know, experimental archaeology. There is a shield that was found that was done with grass around the outside as a rimming and had grass underneath the actual leather or hide. For the exact reason, we don't know. Roland Vorzeka, a good friend of mine, is working on one right now and uh, trying to do a reproduction of it. I think he's doing an excellent job to experiment with it and see why. That's all we can do is experiment with what we find to see why and how it was used. The problem with the Goxted ship shields, if you see here, this is six millimeters thick. This is 10 millimeters thick. This one's about a third of an inch and this is a quarter of an inch. Now, if you look at these two materials, they don't look anywhere near as thick as what you held up, and they're very fragile. What you held up is about this length. I tried to do the best example I could, and this is 14 millimeters thick. You said the thickest part of your shield, which I this one and how thick it looks, me holding it up, other than the taper. I saw the taper on the edges of yours, uh, and this is not to put you down in any way. It, you said 16 millimeters to 6 millimeters. Well, that means your very edge is 6 millimeters, but that's the very edge. And then a lot of it's probably about a third, but it's only the very edges of the shield. You only get about so much tapered. It's not this whole shield. It's just the very edge of the shield. So what that means is the vast majority of your shield is over a half inch thick. Now, we have found some historical shield boards, uh, not in any... Uh, common Scandinavian finds, but we found historical shield boards that appear to be that thick, but not the Goxted ship shields. They were anywhere from six millimeters to 10 millimeters thick, maybe five to 10 millimeters thick. And I just think maybe you didn't get the proper information when you did your, your experimental archeology span and testing uh, and realized that the actual shields themselves are so much thinner, but that's why the conservators and archeologists who wanted to see how these shields were used if they were actual shields, because there was debate because of the pigment on the shield, but they weren't even anything but burial shields. But we find the umbo on there, we see the holes for the rimming, and a lot of that detail, kind of like we found just the shield blank on the man. Uh, why would, in Grimstrup, why would you go to all that detail for a shield you're just gonna put on there for ornamentation on the side of a ship if it wasn't used? I don't think you would, and why would you go to the trouble to thin white pine, because most likely they, they were white pine, uh, to that kind of degree, even though it would have been denser wood, and yes, denser wood possibly, because older trees could be used, uh, and get a little bit stronger wood, it still wouldn't be very much different than the woods we have here. And if you see, this is quarter inch linden wood, which flexes a lot. I mean, this is more flexible than white pine, which means inside of hides, the reason it's talked about in the migrational age, and what they did is they didn't project these modern shields like you brought up the kite shields and the uh, later century shields, the uh, heater shields, and send them back to the Viking Age, and the Viking Age was the Dark Age and no one knew of such a thing, and they would have just taken some thick wood and made a barn door and tried to fight with it, because I can already tell you the shield this thick, even with rimming and with a proper umbo and a handle, would be very heavy, it'd be, as heavy as this, if not heavier, and be ridiculous. I mean, you'd, you'd have it, but it would still split and break when you hit it with axes. You put an axe through this, you know, with the rimming. If you hit it with a, uh, like a dang axe. But this here, it flexes, and that's what they would have used like during the Sutton Hoo or Sutton Ho find, like we did on the shield over here. And this is uh, f uh, six, uh, six millimeters to thinner at the edge, to about three to two millimeters as it goes to a thin edge, you know, thinner edge. So what I'm trying to say is, you see the flex on it? And this is the famed linden wood from the Anglo-Saxon uh, rune poems and the sagas where they talk about the lind skjolder and the lind, 
the Linden's Gilder. Uh, it flexes, but at a certain point, it'll still break. And it's just the way it happens. It's got very little grain. Uh, this here is the 10 millimeter uh, white pine. And this is like the thickness of the, the uh, Trilloborg shield. It was exactly 10 millimeters in the middle and tapered thinner towards the edge. As it goes towards the edge, it tapers. So if you look at this, it's fairly strong, but even it will break just like that. So an ax will go clean through it. Now when you get up to the thickness that you've got here, I am strong, but unless I pop this on my knee, it's harder to break, but even then, it split without any kind of covering. And you saw that, how easy that was. And that, that is exactly half inch uh, white pine. And that's about what you're holding up. So yours is thicker even. It's, it's about 0.60th of an inch, almost three quarters of an inch thick. So I can only imagine the weight on it. I'm not trying to put you down, but I don't think that matches the fine from the Goxted ship shield, nor the Trilleborg shield, and certainly not the Birka fine where we find actual facing of leather in the Viking Age on both sides of the shield with a rimming, like the one that Rolf Warming just did, and possibly a little shield clamps on the outside, maybe in unison all the way around, or maybe they were just there to seam the uh, outside around. I don't usually do that. I just usually kind of overlap the rimming. But I do agree with you. There were so many different techniques used that if you didn't have rawhide prepared and ready or a suitable animal that you could slaughter and make the shield, or maybe even a horse, because I think horse is probably a real popular uh, hide. It's very, very thin, very, very tough, more water resistant than uh, other rawhides and very translucent. I think they would have used it and it would show up to be about a millimeter thick, just like they think people were using possibly sheep, goats, stuff like that because of the thicknesses on some of the early migrational shields. And that technique of covering them with hides, that goes all the way back to uh, the uh, Bronze Age. We know shields being covered in hides, even the Iliad. Uh, Homer talks about hide shields. You uh, hear of the Romans using hides sometimes canvas like material made out of linen or, or or some material like that but you hear them covering their shields to strengthen them to give it a flex and it not break as easy and hold the grain together so it won't split like this so i think what's going on here is the shield you tested saying that it's very plausible yes i've used quarter inch shields like this i've hit them with cannabo you know like in my old test videos which isn't totally historical but it was arguing with a tv program and these held up quite well, believe it or not, but it's because of the flex and give. But when you get into heavy bows, if you were using something serious like a thrown spear or a bow that was uh, 90 to 100 pounds, which we have sagas that talk about extreme bows and we have found Viking Age longbows, although they're not exactly like English longbows, they are longbows with long limbs and extreme uh, draw and heavy arrows, uh, like some of the Birka arrows we found, it's going to go through anything. I mean, maybe you could stop it with this if it didn't split, but it's going to go through these 10 millimeter boards that got tapered down to almost nothing even with rimming and certainly go through even the famed Linden uh, Skjolder if it's only six millimeters thick in the thickest point. So I hope that uh, this kind of explains what I'm saying. I don't think you tested a proper shield off the Goxted ship or you might come up with the same idea that a lot of the historians did that they were possibly covered and that single pigment, if it was rawhide or parchment style rawhide, rawhides to, I mean, really thin ones, you would definitely see through it even with the cheese glues that we use here. And you can see today the, the vivid detail through here. And uh, if you look at them, all of them work the same way. And, and you said myself, I said that I had trouble getting images to show through no one would do that. They wouldn't risk not seeing their beautiful uh, device or emblem on the field. Well, that's because when I first did it, I used this technique here. I used the uh, uh, baking soda, or the uh, soda ash, as it had been called back in the day, or uh, natron, which would probably be a silt, silt from uh, rivers and streams and stuff. Uh, it did not work right. I didn't use enough of the baking soda. I used about half as much as I needed to. I was tired, and I also used slightly too much, uh, too high of acidity vinegar when I made my mix, and believe it or not, I had the wrong, uh, the wrong uh, milk as well. I had a 1% milk 
instead of a zero, nowadays they call it a fat-free milk, which is actually true skim milk, which is light, less than 1%. So any fat content messes with the actual glue. You don't want fat in your cheese. You don't want too much acidity to help eat up some of your uh, alkaline material. You want it to almost be an even mix where it's all used up. And not enough of the actual alkaline or the baking soda caused it to not dry properly or make proper glue. So what happened is this started rotting, and as it rotted, you could smell it. And I could tell it was not adhering, it wasn't drying, the thing takes way longer to dry anyway. So it had a really bad ammonia-like smell or rotting smell like rotten stuff. So I immediately took it apart, washed everything, including the board, shield board, and the hide. The problem is the front hide, which is the only one I had that didn't have seams in it. I guess I could have switched the back around because you can see through it quite well and put it over the front, but I didn't. I went ahead and went with the one I had and it had a milky white cast even though I washed it with soap and that's what you do before you adhere it to make sure there is no uh, grease at all to keep the glue from gluing it to the wood properly and the glue and the, and the shields actually sanded or uh, shaved to make sure you have a good surface to glue it to. What ends up happening is uh, with that milky white cast, I thought, well, it would go away when it dried, and that was, it, it didn't. So pretty much, we end up with what we have here. But as you can see here, these work just fine. You can see it. You can see the colors through it beautifully, and it didn't matter whether I used the original glue I used up here. I mean, it's a little hazier but it's still pretty good. I mean, you could see a solid color like black and yellow. So I honestly believe what a lot of conservators and historians uh, and people who did living history to try to recreate thin shields believed that they were covered in something back and front, just like Roth Warming's uh, experimental archeology span recently with the tanned leather. And yes, I believe they could have used tanned leather if they didn't have the rawhide available. But anyway, let's get into how we made these discs, the ones we have here and uh, evaluate which was better or if they were all the same or how well they work for your shield. We've all been waiting for, we're going to go ahead and test out these Lindenwood discs. I've got them with solid colors. Like I said, I think that if you did a backing, like on the Goxted ship, all black or all yellow, they would show through well. And then I've got intricate detail on the other side, just for the sake of testing it, to see how well it shows through. I do agree. Um, I do totally agree that if you wanted a really high, very small detailed emblem, you'd probably paint that on top of the leather like on the one example that I spoke of earlier. But anyway, let's go ahead and continue. We have our hides here. They've been washed. They're slightly wet. They're not soaking wet. They don't have to be. They're more pliable. One side you can tell is the side that it was skinned from. The other side is where the hair would be in the outside of the leather. Have the disc ready to go. And I'm going to be starting off with our horticultural or agricultural lime, hydrated lime. And all this is is pulverized limestone. It's not highly sieved or highly pulverized. But the Vikings, like I had talked to Tom Yursu, uh, about would have probably used something like this. That's why I used it. It makes a really good glue, extremely strong, but it has a white pigment to it due to the calcium deposits in it. That also makes it dry faster, so that's a bonus. I'm expecting this one to dry faster in my hypothesis, but that's part of the test today. We're gonna see how quick they dry, how well they hold on our shield disc, because we're doing back and front, how well they are in translucency to see through them. If you want to do a shield image, and see it through. I did York Sprave shield, and I did bring that up with uh, Arn Coetz. I brought up with Arn Coetz online, which I don't think he was too impressed with that. We did a cartoon image of York Sprave on the shield he tested. The whole reason we made the original shield here the Goxted ship, and I've even thinned this down more since then to make it lighter. That's why I don't believe they would have thinned it down to that degree if they weren't going to face it back in front, because if you did uh, not need to thin it down that much, you wouldn't do it. It's mostly to relieve the weight, to reduce the weight and increase the mobility of the shield. But today we have our discs. They're not thinned in any way. They're just flat discs. They have been sanded. 
down so they will adhere properly just like I normally do. These have been scuffed up slightly and uh, washed with uh, soap and water. I use soap and water to make sure there is no oils on them so they will adhere properly. But we'll start off with this one as a control. We already know what it does. We've seen what it does up here. Even the re shield repairs have a milky white cast on the outside which I'm not too impressed with. But this is probably most likely what they would have had in a pinch like I said unless you had something more refined or better. As for baking soda, we'll try that. It normally dries clear. I've used this before. It's kind of old faithful. It takes longer to dry. Uh, it could be known as soda ash or natron. Uh, the Egyptians used natron or nitron, however you want to pronounce it. And they used it just like you'd use baking soda. It's just that it didn't have as much baking soda in it. So I don't know if it'd be any better than this here if you use natron. Uh, if you had soda ash and somehow had it refined to a degree where you had more baking soda, I think it would work really well. That's going to be our other concoction. Then we have our uh, pickling lime. This is more finely ground, sieved, and mostly calcium hydroxide, uh, hydro hydrogenated lime. So calcium hydroxide, like I said, calciums are usually the best for the glue. Even the old masons back in the day talk about using calcium hydroxide as a secret in their martyr, if it cracked, the calcium would leach into it and seal the cracks up to make like the old temples and the old uh, cathedrals and stuff stand longer. So I'm expecting this one to do really well. We just don't know how translucent it's going to be, but it should be better than this one. This is our control. We're going to start off with this one and we will do all three of them and put them on here. I shall probably do the red as the control and these are more likely to show through, which we want to see how well they show through. We'll use the blue and the black for the other two. I'm going to go ahead and start mixing them. What we've done is we've done our uh, cheese and the way we made our cheese or our casein is we use one tablespoon of vinegar to 100 milliliters of fat-free milk or skim milk. Skim milk is what you use. You can use skim milk if you had natural uh, whole milk that's unpasteurized and unhomogenized. You could just use the skim milk from it and do this. But I use what they call at the store now fat-free milk, which is a like marketing gimmick for skim milk, which skim milk's been around forever. But anyway, I've got this made, and this is 200 milliliters of cheese or casein. And I used filters like I normally do, I like coffee filters. Uh, the reason why is you get all the casein out of it. And no, I don't rinse it. Uh, Tom Yursu asked me if I rinse the glue. No, because the 5% vinegar that I use, the white vinegar, distilled vinegar, usually gets eaten up in the process to make it and you don't want to heat it past uh, I believe it's 60 degrees Celsius I'm not sure uh, exact in that but I know it's not over 104 degrees Fahrenheit we've got all of them here you don't even really need to heat them if you want to set them wait uh, let them set and wait but I've got all of them here and we're going to start mixing them and I'm going to glue rawhide on both sides and weight them down and then we will come back and see how easy it is to try to peel it loose how well they bend and Decide which one's stronger and which one's better because we're doing modern shields and if you want to make your own glue even if you're not sure if they would have had baking soda you might want to do that if you want to make sure your emblem shows through and I have used it before successfully for that kind of thing so let's go ahead and start and we'll start mixing them for the actual recipe of mixing this up these are 200 milliliters so like I said every 100 milliliters you want one teaspoon of your alkaline so what I'm going to do is start putting these in here to start off with before I add the water and then you add water till it's the right consistency. And the way this works is if it's too curdy, you add powder. Powder would be the alkaline, which in this case we're using the horticultural and we'll put two of these in. If it's too uh, pasty, you add more water. The thing about these, they dry extremely quickly, especially with this one here because it has a lot of extra calcium in it that helps dry it out. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start mixing this up. And I've got a way here to add sterile water to it, just a little bit. And we'll start with this one. This is our Old Faithful that we used in the video and realized it was one of the strongest glues that we had. The uh, hydrogen lime is basically like powdered limestone. It's probably more historical for the Viking Age and less dangerous to you. You don't want to breathe it, but you're not going to breathe much of it anyway because it's very nasty. Just don't get it in your eyes. The greatest danger, it can dry your hands out. 
uh, if it gets on your hands, but your eyes, it could damage your eyes. So be very careful not to get it in your eyes. And you want about the consistency of white glue. Like uh, carpenter's glue, or people didn't know this as uh, cheese glue or uh, casing glue. They would just call it wood glue throughout the ages. I got the glue and they're about the right consistency and I'm applying it. And this is for our uh, old faithful, so to speak, glue. The one we used on our last video with the linden wood. So we pretty much know what it's gonna do, hopefully. It's gonna be really strong and hopefully we'll see our image through it. Seeing how we did the glue, you've seen what mater materials we use in it, what actual types of alkali material we use to create the glue, and they were all the same except, uh, recipes were basically the same except for using baking soda or soda ash and, uh, or natron, whatever they would use to make it with at the time. I don't know what they would have available. And you saw us use the powdered limestone, which just the Vikings or Scandinavians used it. They carved stones in it. They made monuments out of it. Uh, they had stone quarries where they could get limestone. And they even find weights that they used for looms, loom weights, to uh, hold the threads made out of uh, limestone. So they could have easily pulverized limestone, even mining limestone or breaking pieces of it, you pulverize it and you would have the material you need. That's why I use the horticultural or agricultural on the shield here because I thought it'd be more uh, authentic. It does give a white milky cast. You can see that, but you can still see, you don't want to use very much glue if it's pressed on properly. Uh, it doesn't uh, impede the color very much. You can see the red that I thought was going to be very difficult to see through here. The intricate detail, and no, I don't think, I mean, Arn Coates, I know that we're not addressing you through the whole video, but I still think that was a, a, a very nice reply. I'm not angry at you or anything. I thought it was beautiful. It's, people nowadays don't do stuff like that. But no, I don't think they would do that. I think you're right. That's too intricate a detail, like on the uh, one diagram with the red, black, and white. Uh, but you could still see it. Just like when I did the one over here, we used the baking soda on it. And you can see the color through beautifully, and it is even clearer. It has a clear cast to it. It almost looks like a clear glue when it dries, like an Elmer's style glue. But it did kind of stain our wood on the back and make it a little darker than this one did. If you notice, the wood looks lighter, but of course it could be because this has a little white cast to it that's making the wood look lighter. And this one just is glue, glue on wood that was dried. But we could see the grain through this one, and it didn't have that accident where it didn't dry properly. And when I did Yark Sprave Shield, you can see his image in it beautifully. And if you look at the disc when they're laying on this before they were wet or anything, or even um, glued to it, you could see through it in the picture. So I hope you can tell that yes, I'd honestly believe that a solid color will show through or could be put in the glue itself. You could just put a pigment in it, just like this has a white cast to it. You could add a uh, black or a yellow or a blue or something and have that as your background and then paint stuff on top of it. If you wanted to, to use that as an effect and make it easier not to lose the full color of the shield, if you want always be seen. But you look at it, it turned out excellent. Uh, this one took way longer to dry. This one here took, I would say, with the wet hides, what, about 48 hours? About two days to dry properly. This one took 72 hours or longer, and it's because it doesn't have the calcium base in it, it doesn't dry itself out. So since it doesn't have the calcium and it's, qu it's not quite as strong, but this is almost strong to the point of being hard, I almost think the baking soda, if you can get it to work right, might be better, uh, the soda ash, because it's a little more flexible, maybe, for the hides. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, for everything, gluing wood together, but to gluing the hide on, since the shield has to have some flex, this might be better. But as you can see, I've got it here. I'm trying to pull it off. I think I would be pulling the wood off if I pulled hard enough to pull it loose. It is not coming off. It's on there good, just like our other one over here. So I was thinking if I could pull it off, then yes, we know it's not good glue. But both of these are done very well. This one's very strong too. cannot pull it off and uh, they did warp a little bit but they're very small pieces and I did them all at once. Normally I do one side and let it dry until it starts to bend the shield one way 
then I press the other one on and weight it down and glue it. And then if I have to, I take it outside and flip it over back and forth as it's finished drying out. Because of course, with weight on it, weighting it down to press it, it holds some of the moisture underneath it and doesn't dry out as quick. You take it outside, put it in the sun, and let the sun help dry it out. But if you can tell, they all turned out the same. Everything you can see, the color through, this one's probably a little more cloudy or murky, but they don't all uh, adhered very well, except for drying times. I think they're all plausible glues, like I showed in the first video. You can use them. You just have to get used to them. I would say do some experiments with them first before you go into a major project like this, or like this, or you might end up with an accident like I did. Don't do it while you're tired and in a hurry and in a rush and use the wrong materials, use the wrong vinegar, the wrong milk by accident and I put the wrong amount of measurement in for the larger amount I miscalculated. I figured that out later when I smelled the weird ammonia smell and got down there and smelled the rotten smell. Uh, but yes, when we did do it correctly, you can put this between two uh, saw horses and stand on it as well just as you could with this one here. So they're both extremely strong. I think they exhibit the qualities that you see in shields in the sagas and in the old Anglo-Saxon text and I believe that is the standard for a shield of the time period. I mean, I truly do. And I don't think it was something that only came about later century, because as we know, it was in the Sutton Hoo, Sutton Ho era, era. We find that in the graves. His was actually a linden skjolder or a skjolder. And then before that, we find it all through the migrational age and back into the Roman age and back into the ancient Greeks. I hope everybody's enjoyed the video today. I hope these glues have helped people so they can make uh, shields themselves and be able to do this same kind of thing. I mean, that's, that's what I say. As long as everybody can do what they want and be able to experiment, we'll learn more and more about the Shields. And thank you again, Royal Forming and your team, uh, Tom uh, uh, Ursel. Thank you again. And uh, be sure and go by and check out VKNG's stuff and you take advantage of those deals down below if you can. It helps us out, helps them out. I'm sure you'll enjoy what you find there. And as always, Farvel. As a little side note, the bowl sitting next to Thran is a treatment solution that we created made out of beef tallow and beeswax with a ratio of six tablespoons of tallow to five beeswax. This is to make it a little bit more solid than the oil itself gives due to the fact that the situation will get a waterproofing. It also makes it so that you can actually spread it out unlike if you were just using beeswax in a much easier amount. And I'm going to go ahead and put some on today. Good point, Caddy. I almost forgot about it, and I really wanted this in the video. We went to a lot of trouble to make it. This bowl's been sitting here the whole time. It's not glue. And I apologize. Thank you. But I have been very tired. I'm in between jobs in real life, doing different jobs. And I haven't had time to put videos out. So I do apologize to anybody out there. I promise videos, too. And we are going to have our whip videos out. We're going to have a long sword video out soon. But I did want to put this on and see what kind of effect it had on it. If we could see through it better. And uh, making them in bath form, so it's easier to spread on big sheets. So that they don't oh, most certainly. Off. Let's go ahead and rub a couple of them down. And it won't hurt the leather. I have, did it on some test pieces before we did this video. And uh, it doesn't do anything to the rawhide in making it a weaker, more flexible. It does not act like water and seep into it. It just sets on the outside. And it's, it's just like a, a uh, weatherproofing or waterproofing. Which is why we were trying to figure it out with the big shields. Definitely, because if the Goxted sh shields were rawhide covered, or even if they were covered with tanned hides, the seawater splashing up on them, the sea spray, and the would weather with them. rain would damage them over time. But I think when the glue gets wet, it is water resistant. So if the hides did get soaked again or saturated, if you let it dry, which when I did this shield and rethinned it down and were able to get one side off by wetting it and peeling and wetting and peeling it with hot water, when I let it totally dry, the back side did not have to be redone because it just re-adhered just like it was. So as long as you allow the shield to dry out and the physical construction of it, even if it did get somewhat wet, would survive. But if you had a coating on it of something that would not allow it to soak up water, it would be way better and the shield would hold up and you wouldn't have any effects from water. We should, we should do real quick before I leave. Normally we do stuff like this sometimes, just come right back when we're getting ready to go. Uh, do we have any water? Oh my drink, please. <laughs> it's a Guinness glass, can't do any better than that. Yes, but so hot I need water. 
And I can see it here. I don't know if you all can, but. And yes, I'm putting water on the table, which I'll get off, but nothing is soaking in the weather. It's beating and running off completely. So, yeah, is it possible to weatherproof it? Is it safe? Yes, the only thing I would say, if, you, if you're gonna use the shield and damage it like I do and try to repair it by wetting it, remember, that's gonna impede how quick it, is, it absorbs water. I know that the holes in it, the wood will absorb water, and if there's none on the back side, the glue and the, uh, le uh, the actual hide will absorb water, so it should seal back up, but it may be more difficult. You might have to really good, scrub it, and just wash that one area, you're gonna fix the hole. And that washing should help get water into it as well, because this causing it to bead is great if you have the shield intact and don't want it damaged by the water or the rain or the environment, but you run into that problem of, you know, it might make it a little harder to repair it if you want to wet it and then re-glue it to seal up holes and stuff like we've done on both these shields here that you can't even hardly tell. Anyway, as always, thanks Caddy for bringing that up. We almost forgot it. And as always, Farvel. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can always support a Thane Thran YouTube channel shirt that you can get over at ViralStyle.com at the Thane Thran Merchandise Store. We have coffee mugs, koozies, a wide variety of shirts and hats. You can also help support us on Patreon, and if you do that, you'll also get exclusive content that can only be seen there.